Charles Darwin, great philosopher of modern science, regarded as both a heretic and a genius, father of a theory that forever altered the views of science and contradicted Judeo-Christian beliefs in a special creation. Charles Robert Darwin was born February 12, 1809, to Robert Darwin, a medical doctor, and his wife Susanna Darwin, who died when Charles was eight years old. Charles was raised in a devout family who belonged to the Church of England, and he was the youngest of six children. Darwin attended the University of Edinburgh in Scotland to study medicine with his brother. His father wanted him to become a doctor, but Darwin felt sick at the sight of blood. However, Charles was more fascinated by the study of natural history and science, and was largely influenced by his grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, author of Zoonomia or the Laws of Organic Life. In his early 20s, Darwin was requested aboard the HMS Beagle as the ship's naturalist and a gentleman companion to the captain. The voyage began in 1831 and spanned five years, traveling around the southern hemisphere. During this journey, Darwin learned many things about nature and about himself. When the ship reached Brazil, Darwin witnessed slavery for the first time. He was astonished and horrified at the capacity of humans to treat other humans like they were no more than animals. Darwin found himself questioning why a good Christian God would allow such cruelty. While aboard the Beagle, Darwin discovered something intriguing. He noticed the differences and the similarities between the beaks of finches from the islands of the Galapagos archipelago as opposed to the birds on mainland South America. By observing these traits, he concluded that the birds had respectively evolved to their separate and different habitats. Darwin's model of natural selection has uh, four steps. The first step is over-reproduction. So there are too many individuals born. Imagine a whole bunch of these guys being born. This is Homo habilis. There's going to be a range of variation. Let's just go with cranial capacity. Um, individuals with bigger brains, individuals with smaller brains. Then there's going to be the selection component. Those individuals with bigger brains probably are going to have better abilities in terms of hunting, tool manufacture, language production. So what's going to happen over time is there's going to be consistent selection towards bigger and bigger brains. So if there's directional selection, you can end up with something like our friend here, Homo erectus. This is going to take long periods of time. The theory of natural selection shows how organisms adapt to the environment around them. When an individual has a mutation in their genetics that helps them to survive, they have a higher probability of surviving and reproducing. The organisms will tend to live and reproduce more often than organisms without the mutation, allowing the genetic trait to be passed down. This allows the species to evolve, resulting in many different variations within a species that can branch off and create a whole different type of plant, animal, or any other living creature. The voyage of the Beagle ended in 1836 and Darwin returned to his home, Downhouse, to formulate his theory. He found that a huge earthquake had destroyed a local church, killing many holy men. This event further shook Darwin's faith in God, for what kind of God would allow his own priests to be killed in such a fashion. Darwin married his cousin Emma Wedgwood at St. Peter's Church shortly after his homecoming. He sired ten children, of which seven survived to adulthood. His beloved daughter Anne passed away at age 10 from an illness, something that greatly affected Darwin. This tragedy served as the final straw, for Darwin could no longer muster any bit of faith towards a god who would kill his darling Anne. Darwin published his findings in the book On the Origin of Species in 1859. In Britain, the initial response to the theory of evolution was more muted than one might expect. The real uproar began when word of Darwin's theories reached America. So people reacted to that fairly negatively, or at least some people did, mostly because we wanted to see ourselves as being unique. Um, Darwin said we were subject to the same sort of processes that resulted in all 10 million different species that we see around today. Um, and that was a pretty big idea to try to wrap your head around. And for many people, it still is. The controversy was most fully expressed during the infamous Scopes Trial or Monkey Trial, a nationally televised lawsuit between pro-evolutionists and Christian fundamentalists. The setting was the small town of Dayton, Tennessee in 1925. Tennessee was one of the states in which teaching evolution in schools was illegal. A young school teacher named John Scopes defied the law and taught evolution in an attempt to be indicted and bring the matter of evolution in schools to court attention. 
Scopes was put on trial by the state of Tennessee, with both sides being represented by famous lawyers. Scopes was represented by the legendary Clarence Darrow, a renowned defense attorney and a self-professed agnostic. The state was represented by William Jennings Bryan, a pacifist Christian and former presidential candidate. Bryan took the Bible as the literal word of God and believed that evolution was a threat to Christian beliefs. The argument of Bryan was definitely at an advantage in small town Tennessee, and the jury was made of primarily southern gentlemen of limited education. The arguments reportedly focused not on the law of the charges against Scopes, but drifted to the authority of the Bible versus the validity of Darwin's theories. Darrow and Scopes lost the trial, and Scopes was fined $100. The same law stood for some 42 years. In 1947, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the First Amendment, separation of church and state, applied to all individual state governments as well as to Congress. This ruling meant that the states who had outlawed evolution and taught the biblical creation story now had to remove all religious curriculum and replace it with science, the exception being private religious schools. The success of the Russian space program, Sputnik, led to an American panic over the lack of science in public school curriculum. There was a concerted effort to focus more on science, including more attention to Darwin's theory of natural selection. A recent attempt to push evolution back out of schools was the introduction of the theory of intelligent design. Philip Johnson and Michael Behe developed this theory, which states that some biochemical structures must have been designed by a higher power, being too complex to have developed organically. However, this attempt did not succeed, with Judge John E. Jones of the Supreme Court ruling in 2005 that it had religious motivations. Well, I guess the big issue with Christianity and evolution is whether or not you take the Bible 100% literally true. So um, I'm a religion teacher here at a Catholic school, and the Catholic Church doesn't take the Bible completely literally, which is why a lot of Catholic Christians don't have a problem accepting evolution. But Christians who think that the Bible is 100% written like true from God see the story of creation then as something that absolutely happened in the order that the Bible says it happened, in which case we've got six days and then God resting, and so evolution doesn't really fit into that. Charles Darwin passed away of natural causes in 1882 at the age of 78. His legacy, however, continues. This is not only a legacy of controversy, for his life's work and accomplishments span far more deep and vast. Darwin explored humanity's place in the universe and contemplated the existence of God. He encountered the viewpoints of people of different religions and cultures. Whether you agree with his ideas and theories or not, Darwin has earned his place in history as a true pioneer of science and humanity.